He knew he should light the light. It was his job, after all. But he knew that they were drawn to it, like a moth to a flame. Better still, like the light at the end of days. They didn't always come, just on rainy nights or stormy nights or at the dark of the moon. <coughs> on bright nights, he supposed that they followed the path across the water trying to make their way to the moon. <coughs> on those nights, he didn't hear or see or really feel them at all. Well, it wasn't as though he ever really heard them. It was just sort of a vibration that went down to his very bones and made every hair on his body stand at attention. His friends told him that he was crazy to live in such a God-forsaken place so far away from anybody else. But he missed being by the lakes. He missed his days on the schooners. He missed the sunrises and the sunsets. He missed the mist on the water. And he missed seeing that light and knowing that he was almost home. He shuddered as he lit the light. They could float, you know. They could float on air as well as in the water of so little substance that they could float upon the wind, and yet too heavy to dissipate. He touched his torch to the oil, and it brightened, and it blazed, and it broke, and it was magnified, and it was sent out across the storm, and across the night, and into the depth. They came, and they came right up to the light. They came so close to the light, trying so hard to touch it, but they could somehow never get through the glass. But it was her eyes, her eyes, that kept him from extinguishing that flame and locking the door and walking away and never coming They were souls, born down by the icy fingers of the lake. They got caught by a bit of rigging on the deck or below decks as they breathed their last, that icy water down into their lungs, trying so hard to live that they didn't realize that they had died. They would come, and she would come. And she would be there, suspended, outside the glass. She was not so transfixed upon the flame as were the others. She would spend some time looking at the light, but then she would turn her attention to him. And she was suspended out there. Oh, she had been beautiful in life, lithe of body, dark raven hair. And he could see the loneliness in her eyes. He could feel the pain. It burned him. It branded him. He wished somehow that he could help her. He wished somehow that he could ease her pain. And then it happened. She reached out to him, and her hand went through the glass and she touched his cheek, and the chill was gone, and the heat of love filled his body. And now, as he looked into her clear, blue, unwavering eyes, he saw their longing in addition to that loneliness. On bright nights, he was restless and could not sleep. On dark nights, he waited and waited for them to come. And when they left in the morning, he was filled with remorse, and he couldn't sleep. 
He could scarcely breathe or sleep or eat until the next time that she came. When he went into town to buy supplies, he became so sunken of eyes and gaunt in the face that people started inquiring after his health. But it didn't matter. She was all that mattered. And so he stopped going into town. One night, he walked out on the balcony that circumference the light, and he felt the November wind on his face and he could hear the waves at the bottom of the lighthouse and at the rocks along the jetty. If you looked up at him, you could see only the silhouette against the light. He looked out into the night. He could feel that chill of winter coming. And they came, and she came. And for the first time, there was joy in her eyes and a smile started to grace her gentle lips. And she beckoned to him, and he stepped off the edge of the balcony, and he felt the heat, and he felt the rocks, and he knew she was alone, no more. <laughs>